Hello everyone, Cloistered Rambler here, and I'm here to talk about what my thoughts are on Tales of Rise. As most fans will know, it is the newest entry into the long-running Tales series, which started all the way back in the SNES, and as of now has had at least 17 mainline installments over the course of 25 years. I got into the series back in 2016 with Tales of Symphonic Chronicles on a PlayStation 3, and the last thing I expected to hear about the series was it's just an action-oriented Final Fantasy. As in multiple games, taking place in different continuities with their own combat systems. Tales of Symphonia was my favorite title for a long time up until Berseria came along and I ended up playing through it. Both games have great stories, and as odd as it sounds, the stories in the series range from either alright to really great, with rare exceptions where the stories reach really high heights, like in the case of Berseria, Symphonia, and Abyss. Games like Graces are lacking as far as story goes, but make up for it in gameplay. And while Arise hasn't necessarily surpassed Graces for me as far as gameplay goes, I consider both of them to be some of my favorite combat systems because of how damn fun both games are. Anyways, the reason I bring all this up is to somehow haphazardly paint a picture of the series' general quality. It's usually pretty good for the most part, and I can't name more than two games I don't like much. It's really consistent when quality is concerned, and there's also games like Abyss and Vesperia, which are part of the so-called Holy Trinity of Tales titles, which include Symphonia as well. A lot of reviews came out about how Tales of Rise is one of the best games in years, and I don't disagree entirely. I loved it, but there's a couple things I would like to address. I think it's worthy of being called the best Tales title in years, but outside of the positives, I'd like to touch on some of the negative aspects of it, mainly to kind of gauge my thoughts on it without much bias, especially months later after having played a bit of the post-game. With that being said, let's get into the story of the game. The story starts off really strong, with the premise being that your protagonist is a Danon slave, the people native to the planet of Dana, fighting five Renan lords, Renans being from the neighboring planet of Rena, with each lord ruling over the five realms. In order to win your freedom after 300 years of oppression, the goal is to defeat all five of them. This premise works really well at setting up a conflict really quickly. It establishes the villains within the first hour of the game and your final goal before all the twists and turns happen later on, of course. Granted, I feel the pace at which the villains are introduced and then taken out of the story does come to the detriment of making them more interesting, to say the least. You, Tales games usually have much more interesting or compelling villains, take for instance Artorias from Tales of Berseria, and even Gaius from Tales of Exilia, and its group of antagonists, each with interesting motivations driving them. Tales of Arise doesn't have that though, and I feel it makes sense considering the perspective you're fighting from and the motivations of the villains being pretty selfish and nearsighted to begin with, with only one goal in mind, one which I won't spoil for anyone here as this is a spoiler free review, but it's divulged within like the first hour of the game, so say you buy the game, you'll already know like by the first hour. On the bright side, you'll have a lot of satisfaction after the boss fights with each lord, but on the other hand, a lot of the villains feel pretty straightforward. They do, however, embody a lot of the themes of racism, given the fact that that's literally their viewpoint. There's also some light touching in the theme of societal indoctrination, but I feel the game didn't do much with this, unless I'm misremembering. It has been months since I played the game, remember? Despite being the more uninteresting cast of villains in a Tales game, they do, however, serve as obstacles for the main characters to take down in order to win freedom for Danans, and to further their character arcs, which I feel that the way this game is structured actually helps a lot. A lot of the character arcs are as well handled as they are in Berseria. Granted, Berseria is a really hard game to top as far as character development goes. I would touch on the other characters, but I want to save that for a video dedicated to just the story and not just other aspects of the game. So, with that being said, let's get into the characters. The first cutscene is set within what is basically a hot scorching land of sorts with flames everywhere, toiling away for the people who've ruled over Dana for over 300 years. You're a man with no visible face, and no identity to speak of, wearing a mask you can't take off. You have no idea where you're from, or who you are, and you have no sense of pain whatsoever. This basically sets up the mystery behind our main character, Alfin. Accompanying Alfin is Shion Imeris. Shion is a Renan whose main goal is to take down the Renan lords. You meet her as she's running away from Renans at the start of the game, for reasons unknown to the protagonist, until her motivations are revealed. Shion isn't able to touch anyone without causing them extreme pain. This sets up a very interesting dynamic between Alfin and Shion, 
as Alfin is the only one who can ever touch her without feeling any pain. And alongside that, Shion is able to summon a flaming sword that only Alfin can wield due to his lack of pain. Despite Alfin's lack of pain, he's not immune to being burned by the sword or being hurt within combat. As our holy beloved mentor character says within the first hour of the game, A sword that sears the hand of he who wields it, and a healing art to mend. A man numb to pain, and a woman whose very touch deals nothing but. The way their character arcs are handled throughout the game is great. Shion is very cold and detached at first, but given the years she's had to live with her thorns, as our beloved mentor character Zephyr coins the term within the first hour of the game, it only makes sense given that most people wouldn't have wanted to get closer. And due to Shion distancing herself, were she not like this, I feel her character arc wouldn't have been as half as compelling as it was by the game's ending. In the main cast and in Usual Tales fashion, you'll find a lot of characters with really well handled character arcs, and in a rise, this remains true. Character motivations for joining your party tend to make a lot of sense, and the way they bounce off each other within the game works really well as far as making them feel like actual people rather than pre-written archetypes with no actual death. Tales characters often have a tendency to start off simple and archetypal only to get more complex midway through the game. Tales of Arise does this a lot, and while I don't think the characters in this game top Berserius cast, I found myself really enjoying moments in the plot when characters were either hit with a revelation or even just more comedic moments in skits which are character interactions which take place in the manga-like panels when Tales of Her Eyes. The game also touches on themes of racism in a way that felt very reflective of historical events, minus the flaming sword, making the struggles of the characters feel all the more painful. While Symphonia does touch on these themes a lot, Tales of Her Eyes feels like it embellishes itself within these themes to the point where it's the central struggle of all the characters. Racial tensions between Danans and Renans within the game's world and the party are presented in an effective way. There's mentions of multiple Danan uprisings that happened over the course of 300 years of slavery, and even characters in the party have their own input on these issues, all of which are varied but feel natural enough. It makes it feel like the characters are really trying to move beyond a lot of their biased beliefs in order to come to an understanding with one another and have more synergy as a group. Skits, despite being optional, provide even more insight into characters' mindsets, adding more depth to them and their viewpoints on the situation their world is facing. I'd go into this more, granted, I do feel this video is already long enough as it is. All that being said, it just works really well. However, going back to the plot for a moment, for as much as I liked it, I have to mention some personal gripes I had with it. I won't go into any spoilers at all, so don't worry. And despite my mentioning of Symphonia, this isn't to say anything about the quality of Symphonia. Rather, that both games approach the topics in different ways, and both do it very well in my opinion. I personally still love Tales of Arise, but I felt it had some problems worth addressing, especially after the first arc of the game wraps up. When it comes to the plot, while it is faster paced than a lot of other Tales games, I don't think that ever brought it down. I can't say the same for the end of the game though. The first half of the game brings plot twists into the picture in a way that works, and at a reasonably paced manner. By the latter half of the game though, you can tell that the writers were trying to squeeze in as many plot points as they could before the ending. The twists work in concept, and even recontextualize a lot of the things in the story, which in my opinion is what makes a twist work. However, it's done in a way that it didn't sit well with me. Needless to say, there was a lot of exposition leading up to the eventual reveal of those endgame plot twists before the story concluded. All these twists happen one after another, to the point where there's a 30 minute video, which I don't recommend searching up if you don't want spoilers, about the biggest twist in Tales of Arise, and I think this puts into perspective how much exposition went on. To give context, there is some gameplay in between to shake things up, but the last 20 minutes of that video all happens without any breaks or battles in between to add variety to an already long sequence of cutscenes followed by multiple skits, and to paraphrase one of the characters during that part of the game, I don't even have the energy to be shocked anymore. I really want to love the last part of the game because a lot of the concepts are so fascinating. Granted, I am very mixed on the latter half for a lot of reasons. The pacing, the way the plot points are introduced rapid fire, and how some subplots feel really rushed. There's also a lot of skits in the final part of the game, and as someone who absolutely loves the skit system in these games, even in Berseria, which has an insufferably huge amount of skits that never seem like they're going to end, I felt really burnt out by the amount of skits. Overall, I do feel the end of the game could have been better paced in general, but the plot took the hardest hit out of all the parts of the game, and that's not to say the story isn't great. I really liked it, and while it's no Berseria, Symphonia, or even Abyss, I do think it at least deserves to be on par with games like Exilia and Vesperia. Between Arise, Vesperia, and Exilia, 
I personally feel that all three games kind of suffer from a rushed conclusion. Out of all three endings though, I personally felt that Arise wrapped up nicely at the end. It's not my absolute favorite ending, but it is one that left me really satisfied after finishing the game. Speaking of the game, now it's time to actually get into the gameplay. If I were to give Arise heavy praise anywhere, it would have to be the gameplay. This gameplay for me has rivaled Graces as far as combat goes, and I have yet to play New Game Plus because of how it's handled in this game, and just because the post game is a bit too fun of an excuse to keep putting off New Game Plus. However, considering I find the game to be as good as Graces, especially before New Game Plus, then I can't wait to see what the game is like on New Game Plus. I expect it to exceed all expectations on New Game Plus when the time comes, but for now, let's just talk about the base game. For context, the Tale series is usually split between two different distinct audiences and playstyles. Those that enjoy the more action game-like gameplay, and chaining combos together, almost like a Bayonetta or a Platinum game, and those who enjoy a more fighting game-like style of combat. Something along the lines of Street Fighter or modern fighting games, so I don't play fighting games, please bear with me on this analogy. In games like Abyss, Symphonia, Vesperia, and Rebirth, I'm gonna mention it because I want it to be released in the West, please Namco, and the other 2D titles fall in line with what a fighting game like RPG would feel like, I assume. I'm somewhere in the middle with a slight lean towards the more action-oriented combat. Arise ditches more of the fighting game-like aspects in favor of being more akin to your standard combo chaining action game, and whether you enjoy it or not depends on the kind of game you're looking for coming into Arise. It starts off a little slow and the game gets rid of the starting and linear motion, a staple of the series since Fantasia. At first I wasn't too on board with guarding being gone, but it really helps the flow of combat. Not too far into the first hour of the game, you get a mechanic that's related to perfect dodging that is akin to Bayonetta's Witch Time. As for attacks and abilities, you start off with 3 arts, 2 ground, and 1 aerial. Your arts are divided between ground and aerial arts, and that's a first for a behind the shoulder. Shoulder? Okay, shoulder I say it is. Tails game. In other Tails games with graces like combat systems, you were planted to the ground with the only thing making it seem like your jump being the attack animation and that's about it. You get an actual jump button and a rise which you can use to chain aerial arts or standard attacks mid-air. And later you can get aerial arts that allow you to slam enemies in the ground and you can continue your combo from there. You not only have arts, but as I mentioned, you also get a standard attack, just like in 2D titles. This means you have something aside from your AG pool to pull attacks from, with 4 consecutive hits, and it means longer combos in battle when you pair them with arts, and this gives you more room for creativity than even games like Graces do. A game I praise the high heaven for its really well-designed combat system, by the way. Just when it seems like the game has introduced enough mechanics, it adds more onto an increasingly more in-depth combat system. Other characters don't just stand around and attack without end with a set catalog of strategies which you can edit like in prior games. You can call for assistance from party members in certain circumstances when a specific character is needed. This is what's called a boost attack, and it lets you incapacitate enemies if you use the right character on the right enemy type leading into boost break. This is not only useful for boost breaks, but it also gives you more AG for each use of a boost attack. This allows you to extend combo chains. This isn't even getting into the various perks certain characters have that are exclusive to them alone. Alpin is basically an all-around boost breaker, as you can incapacitate any enemy. Beyond's perk for a boost attack is being able to down flying enemies, and characters like Law break the barriers of defense of enemies, leaving them vulnerable to attack. The game also has a title system similar to Grace's without having like 100 titles per character, thankfully. Holy shit, Namco, what the fuck am I looking at? Which is neat! I personally love the title system of Graces, and I feel the game's title system is probably my favorite as far as character progression goes in Tales games. There's so much choice you get as far as what skills, attacks, passive abilities, and attributes, and stats you can increase. You of course need to unlock each title, but it's not hard at all to unlock them. I encourage it because all the abilities become very useful near the end of the game can feel a bit slow to unlock some parts of it, but you don't need to rush it as by the end of the game you already have most of what you need set on your character. What I like about this is that each player's party is going to be catered to their playstyle alone, and unlike other progression and level up system, it's never going to be a fixed path. You can come back on another playthrough and find out, oh this skill is better to get now compared to the one I chose before in my last playthrough, and that's something I love in an RPG. Leveling systems like these remind me of Final Fantasy X Spear Grid, a uh, leveling system that even now still hasn't been top for me. If there's any leveling system you feel is better, then let me know, I'm interested. 
back on point, I still think it's a neat way to build your party to your liking. Needless to say, the game handles itself extremely well as far as combat goes. Regular encounters are made to be very engaging with the new combat system. Outside of the regular encounters, you have boss battles, a part of the game I'm going to get into now. Boss battles feel like events rather than regular battles. This is a double-edged sword in my opinion. Bosses feel very cinematic and have more weight to them as far as the narrative goes, but I often found that they sometimes lasted a bit longer than I personally would have liked. I do enjoy that they were a lot more challenging than prior games though, because Berserius boss battles, for as fun as they were, they're really easy, even on the highest difficulty. That goes for a good majority of Tales games. I found myself actually getting killed by bosses multiple times, and that's refreshing when most Tales games have extremely easy bosses. It's almost like in Vesperia in the sense that bosses really ramp up the difficulty. However, unlike Vesperia, they do start to drag on later on in the game. This is due in part to really spongy bosses that take a lot of hits to defeat. Even when I felt I understood the game's combat well enough, bosses near the end of the game could still take a while to defeat. I'm a busy college student, so I don't have all the time in the world to grind EXP to level up, and even with leveling up, there were some bosses at the end that even then still had too much HP. I wouldn't let this scare anyone away, but it's worth keeping in mind the end of the game has its own assortment of issues that could have just been a result of the last half being rushed. My hope is that this gets remedied by the next game, because I do feel there were some things in the endgame to like, such as the challenge, but sometimes it was a bit all too much at once. Regardless, I do have to give praise to the combat because even if in battles that felt a bit more unbalanced than usual in the end of the game, I still had fun, partially because I'm a masochist who likes getting my ass handed to me by the game, just not all the time. When you go into that final dungeon, I say prepare yourself well because it is full of HP sponge enemies. I haven't touched on exploration yet, but I feel that Arise has the strongest exploration in the series. Before more details were released on how the game was like and how much it would stray from series tradition, there were people here and there that thought the game would be open world, and even I started to believe it because of how the world looked so open-ended in the trailer. Namco did however clear that up not too long after the trailer for the game had dropped back in 2019, confirming it wasn't in fact open world. We still have the usual field maps, but much more improved and with a lot more hills, slopes, and far more verticality than ever before. While there isn't necessarily any platforming to speak of or much of it, the jump button makes a nice addition to the exploration aspect of the game, as it makes the way you move through the world feel far more immersive than in previous Tales games. On top of that, there's a lot of variety from area to area, whether it be the theme of the setting based on the element of each respective lord, or the way the terrain is designed. This doesn't carry over into dungeons much, unfortunately, since dungeons aren't too much improved from previous Modern Tales title, and the only thing to give them any kind of identity has to be the way they're textured, if anything. The puzzles in Reason Tales dungeons are very lacking to say the least. This game continues the trend of rather underdeveloped dungeons. As far as towns go, they have to be some of the best I've seen in a series, and maybe even the best towns I've seen in an RPG that doesn't go by a name Xenoblade Chronicles 2 trademark for the Nintendo Switch for at least 2017. Vicente is the most noteworthy one, but places like Cislodia and other areas were also neat to explore, even if they weren't as varied as the overworld in which they're located in. Even the first realm of the game has a lot going on, as well as a level 40 mantis you'll come back and kill later on in the game. There's also a distinct feeling to every town, unlike other Tales games where they felt like just standard RPG towns. In Arise, they feel like they have something to make each one of the towns stand out. It's the only time in the series where I can actually remember all the town names because they're actually unique. For as much as I love Brazoria, I can only remember so many similar looking towns, and if I'm being honest, I can't remember the name of a single one. Which goes to show how well Arise did while fleshing out its world. You also get some nice quests, and thankfully unlike other Tales games, there's actually a quest marker for people like me with no sense of direction when it comes to finishing quests. You can get Gauld, SP, as well as to gain new titles. It comes in handy because in Arise, Gauld is hard to come by and killing enemies hardly rewards you enough SP to quickly fill out titles, so if you have enough time to spare it's worth doing some side quests. I also think the game has the best quests in the series, at least personally and I will talk more on that in the post-game section. When it comes to what can be found within each location, there's plenty of collectibles to find. You can mine resources from the environment to collect materials in order to forge better accessories. 
On top of that, you also have the ability to find ingredients and make food with the new camping system, which I really like. The camping system also gives you plenty of dialogue options later through the game where you can speak to party members and it fleshes out the party members even more. The cooking system gives you passive effects that take place either on the field or during battle or give you bonuses for finishing battles. Say I make pizza or something, not an actual recipe in Arise. In Tales of Arise, cooking it would give you the ability to find more rare ore in field map. Or say you make ice cream. Again, I don't think this is an actual recipe in the game. And this would give you a higher elemental defense. They're not massive boosts in stats, but they're noticeable enough and can come in handy during certain situations. While roaming, enemies are on the field, as is standard for modern Tales games. From enemies, you can also get materials in order to forge weapons. However, I do advise you keep some weapons on hand. It can suck later in the game when you sold your weapons only to find out that the weapon can be really useful for crafting an even better weapon later on. Older weapons can still be used as parts to upgrade it into a better weapon. There is a lot when it comes to exploration. On one final note, Arise has this owl mascot called Hoodle and you find these little owls around the world and they give you little accessories to put on your characters. These can show up during cutscenes which can be pretty funny sometimes. Unfortunately, unlike in Berserian's Asteria, you can't edit how big the accessories are. Granted, they are more noticeable now, mainly due to the updated art styles. Maybe that's just me, but I felt the accessories in older titles were nice, but kind of blended in with the lack of a pronounced art style in those entries. In Tales of Arise, I can easily put cat ears on Alvin and think, oh yeah, he has cat ears, rather than like in Zestaria where I put the same thing on the main character and I'm like, oh right, I forgot he had cat ears on. There's even DLC costumes, granted I'm not one to spend money on DLC accessories. There's other videos that do show them off. Unfortunately, Arise doesn't have any legacy costumes, so you won't get to reference the absolute badass Yuri Lowell with a DLC costume. If something does change in the future, this part of the video will be outdated, but as of the making of this video, there are no legacy costumes in Arise to speak of, and I hope they do get added in the future. Anyways, now that that tangent is aside, I really like the owls because their design is cute as hell, to the point that there's a Hoodle special edition of the game, which I thought was worth mentioning. I just think Hoodle is really neat. I mean, look at him, how can you not love him? And how he bullies the law pretty much the entire game. Now I'm just a passive enjoyer of music during games, and an active enjoyer when I'm on my phone. However, this is a great OST. And while not all the songs are memorable, the ones that are really hit home and even got stuck in my head after a while. The field themes while not necessarily remarkable for listening to outside of the game, with the small exception being Elden NCS field theme, are pretty good. However, they really do suit the environments and make them feel the most alive that a set of field maps in a Tales game has ever felt. They're nice to listen to, but I can't say I'm in any rush to pull up the field themes on my phone. Now, the music in dungeons and multiple battle themes are probably the most powerful earworms in the entire franchise for me. I can't name a single battle theme I didn't at least give a listen to on YouTube, and while I don't actively search for the boss themes, they are really good. The Tales games are really good at one thing regarding music, and has always been delivering on really good boss themes and battle themes. The added cinematic flair on top of Motoi Sakuraba's compositions for this game really add to the feel of battles, and make the bosses actually feel like a balance between life and death. And it, you will die a lot, I, I think. Unless I just suck at the game, but we're going to ignore that comment. The opening theme is really good, and there's this song called Blue Moon by Ayaka, and I won't mention what point of the game the song plays at, but it's at such a perfect and pivotal part of the story that it just felt satisfying to hear when it came up. I am really happy to say, Zestiria no longer holds the crown for the best soundtrack. Don't ever make me speak about that game unless you want to have your ear talked off for all the wrong reasons. If you like it, though, that's okay, I just... I don't like Zestiria. Anyways, onto the visuals of her eyes. I haven't touched on the game's graphics yet, but this game looks beautiful, and I'm running this on an RX 550, and while my GPU could be better, it's enough to bring out the best of the game's visuals. It looks amazing compared to Berseria, which came out in 2017, which ran on the same engine from Tales of Exilia, which released, uh, when was it? I forget, I'm just gonna put some text on screen. It has a light bit of cell shading, and I love how it looks. It really makes the anime art style stand out, and for once in the series' life, no one can compare the graphics to a PlayStation 2 game. That's an achievement. 
The visual jump from the Exilia engine all the way to Unreal Engine 4 was the right move, undoubtedly, because the world of Arise feels alive and immersive. Cutscenes also look great, and the choreography is leagues above what games like Berseria were able to pull off, and Berseria was like the peak of how impressive cutscenes were on the Exilia engine. Even in Berseria, though, taking off the rose to thick glasses reveal a bit of stiffness in the way some cutscenes were portrayed obviously due to limitations on the Exilia engine. Arise makes characters move and speak and have body gestures that actually make them move like real people for once. I know graphics aren't everything, but it's so important to point out considering every other Tales games before now just ran on what's essentially just Exilia's engine. That's 10 years of Tales games on the same engine. Christ. I'm about to touch on the post game a little. So, for those who don't want any spoilers at all, even if they're only gameplay related, skip this timestamp right here. Anyways, back on point, when it comes to the post game for those completionists out there, you're in for a treat, especially if you're a longtime Tales fan. Like me, I'm so thankful Symphonia got me into the series. Anyways, there's also new boss fights and extra side quests. All I can say is that the only other game to hold me this long after the game finishes are Tales of Berseria, Xenoblade, and Xenoblade 2. If you're asking, no, I do not have a thousand hours on Xenoblade 2, jokes aside, there's enough there that it feels like the game is far from being done, and I love the side content so far. You also get access to artifacts which give you different effects during gameplay. Some provide EXP boosts, limit your damage to enemies to one if you want to practice different combo chains, a feature I wish every Tales game had, and one for more damage which can speed up the pace of fights in the post game. Granted, the multiplied damage applies to you as well, so it is kind of a risk to use the item during boss fights, especially if you're not the best at perfect dodging. The Tales series ever since Symphonia, I think, has almost always had cameo battles, with the exception of games like Exilia or Symphonia Dawn of the New World and some others, but all I can say without spoiling who's in this game, it didn't really disappoint at all. Really, every Tales cameo battle is a treat to fight, and I can only say finishing the one in this game was worth it. It was really fun, and I was left wishing for more. For older fans looking into this game, you'll get a lot of fan service in the post game. Needless to say, I was satisfied as hell when I got through it, and if anyone watching this is convinced at all to buy the game, I guess I did my job, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I personally feel that Arise's new additions to the overall structure of the series opens the way for new opportunities to experiment with the series' formula while keeping the series traditional enough to feel like a Tales game. The game may have stumbled a bit at the end, but it's an evolution for a series, and I might make a separate video on the story when I'm finally ready to replay it. God knows when that is. I have some other games I wanted to cover. One is an RPG released on the PS2, which got a remaster back in 2017, and I've been really enjoying it. That game being .hackdu last recode. The other is a visual novel, Chaos Child. While I love playing Tales of Arise, there's other video projects I want to get around to. For those who have finished the game, let me know what you thought about it. I personally really loved it, and I'd like to hear other people's thoughts on the game. Anyways, have a good day, and I hope you enjoyed the video.